Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. Today's guest lives in Michigan and loves helping develop kids in different sports. Some of his top accomplishments are as follows. He played D1 basketball at Dartmouth. He also golfed there and won the college golf championship his senior year. He was a pro golfer for five years, and in 2006, he started Basics Sports. Our guest today is Jim McGannon, who also works on mental strength training with athletes. Welcome, Jim. Let's get started with this wide-ranging conversation. Thanks, Rob. I look forward to it. Glad you could be here. My first question is always kind of off the wall, but I think you'll have fun with it. So you'll have three choices to pick from, and I'm going to shoot the question at you right now. If you had to caddy for one of these three golfers, who would you choose and why? Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, or Tiger Woods? You know I caddied for Arnold Palmer once, don't you? Oh, you did. <laughs> I actually caddied for the King. So, yeah, I would pick Arnold Palmer, and I can tell you the five-and-a-half-hour experience. I can boil it down. Yeah, it was an incredible stream of events that led me to this. Yeah, I caddied for Arnie once. Why don't you just recap that? Well, I was, I was playing pro golf. I was in Pinehurst, North Carolina. The U.S. Senior Open was there in 1994. That's when I was the caddy master. There were no caddies available, or actually it's a longer story. They, they just were intimidated by the fact that it was Palmer. So I, I grabbed the bag, and uh, I had a little over five hours with him on course number two, which is the famous course there. There was another great player in the group, Dal Finsterwald, who was Palmer's best friend. And so we went out, and he was working on yardages and working on you know, the golf course and how to play it. Of course, I knew the course like the back of my hand. That's where I worked for five years. So it was an incredible experience. I wrote a story about it. People listening may know about his reputation. Everything they may have heard is completely true. He's just caring and and relatable and, you know, just a wonderful man. So anyway, yeah, I caddy for Arnie once. (laughs) That's awesome. And I'm glad the rumors are true because that's not true on everybody. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's not. And he's just, and there's many anecdotes that are in this story, funny things that happened. Like he pretended that I lost his head cover once. <laughs> and he, he, he had the head cover with him all the time. And he said, you know what, I, where's my driver head cover? And, he, and so I thought I, might, I must have left it back on the tee. So I started running back to the tee, remorseful that I just lost Arnold Palmer's head cover. I get a hundred yards away, and he yells back to me, "Hey, man, look!" And he pulls it out of his <laughs> pulls it out of his back pocket. It's very funny. <laughs> Playing games with you, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's funny. How about now? Can you? Did you play all four years of basketball there? No, I only played two years. Dartmouth is an Ivy League school, and it's a very difficult school. I joke that the D, the block D for Dartmouth, also stood for my grade point average after two years. <laughs> I barely made it through. Uh, a bunch of the guys didn't make it through. Guys don't go to Dartmouth or any of the Ivies to play pro sports. So the emphasis was on the education. So I, I had to quit after two years. But then I also played golf the final two years. That uh, was a great... I walked on and made the golf team, which was a great thing. Oh, Nice. So you did two years of basketball and then two years of golf. Correct. Okay. Did you look at any other schools before going there, or was that where you were going and you had your mindset on it? No, actually, you know, it's it's very interesting. Just about two weeks ago, a member of my team was inducted into the Ivy League Hall of Fame at Princeton. So a bunch of the guys from the team, including the coach, Gary Walters, reconvened in New Jersey, and we actually went to the Ivy League tournament that weekend. Princeton, of course, advanced to the Sweet 16. We got to meet some of the guys. So I looked at Princeton. In fact, their coach, Pete Carell, some of the listeners may know that name. He's a very well-known fundamental coach. 
uh, recruited me, but I didn't get in. (laughs) And I thought that was kind of funny, right? Because that's correct. The academics should come before athletics and they have their priorities straight. So when you tell somebody you were highly recruited, but you didn't get in, that's like not unheard of these days. (laughs) Yeah. And that's frankly the way it should be. Academics should come first. Yep. I agree with that. I tried some of the other Ivies. Um, I got waitlisted at Harvard. I didn't get into Yale, didn't get into Princeton, got into Dartmouth. So I went to Dartmouth. While you were there that senior year, you won the golf championship. Could you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Did it come down to the final hole? Did you have a big lead going in? How, how'd that go down? Well, what's cool about that, it's, and it's hard to explain at all, that's the college golf championship. That includes the medical school, the business school, the undergraduate, the engineering school. So there's a lot There's a lot of schools there. It's not just the undergrad. So there were probably over 100 players in it. My shot 74, and I won by one shot. It's not like it was a high-pressure thing. Uh, it was the college golf championship. And I think I remember part of the last hole, but it, I never thought about actually winning it. I just went out to play. The, the whole entire golf team was playing. And it was more of a internal match play, basically, amongst the golfers, because we were the best players on the campus. But, uh, I mean, I I got into the Connecticut Amateur three times, the Connecticut Open three times. I qualified for the Michigan Amateur three times. So those were actually better events. Winning the college golf championship was was pretty cool. That sounds pretty cool. So basically, you probably didn't know going into that hole that you were close to in the lead because there were so many people on different holes and at different. Yeah. No, yeah. No leaderboards, man. There were no, there were no leaderboards. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and Ventura wasn't commentating either. No, I had no idea. In fact, 74 was relatively high score. It's a par 70. And there were some great players on the, I was like, I think I was a fourth or fifth player on the team. So there were guys who were better than me, but that doesn't mean anything on a given day. Yeah. On a given day, any player can beat anybody. So I was fortunate. Well, that's cool. Cool story there. If you were not involved with sports and in sports, what do you think you would do for a living? That's a great question. I, it's hard to even answer that. I, you know, I was in business for almost... 15 years before I turned pro when I played professional golf and I was in the retail industry. I worked for Brooks Brothers and Alfred Dunhill and Lord and Taylor. I think they're almost all out of business now. The brick and mortars really got hit hard by the pandemic. So I was in the retail business, worked, uh, you know, lived in Dallas and Atlanta and Nashville, New York City. I lived in some pretty neat places before I got married. So I think I would probably be in that industry that's what I did out of college. That definitely makes sense. Can you talk about how and why you started Basics? In a nutshell, it was, I invented it basically because I had to. It was the necessity is the mother of invention. I lived in Michigan. We moved out here in 2000 and I was running a local private golf club. That was the industry I was in after I quit playing golf. I got into private club and resort management. So I was running a, uh, a nice local club. 9-11 came, and I don't know if your listeners know this or not, but 9-11 really hurt a lot of industries, none more than the private club industry. Roughly a third of the members left after 9-11 because the economy tanked, as you may recall. And the private club industry across the country was really hurt. Many clubs went out of business, uh, resorts closed. So I was, I got let go and I didn't have a job now in Michigan, <laughs> in arguably the worst economy in the country. I think unemployment in the state was approaching 20% in the early 2000s. And I was one of them. I got three little kids. I'm at the house, big, big home here in Spring Lake, lovely home, moving from Connecticut, of course. So the dollar went a long way coming from Greenwich, Connecticut to Spring Lake, Michigan. So I have a beautiful home here. My wife wasn't working, which was the plan. We didn't, we wanted to have a traditional family. And so I have (laughs) 90 days severance to figure this out with an interest rate on the home of 9%. I mean, it really was a a difficult situation. 
And so I got some random jobs just to try to get some bread on the table. And then I had this idea of doing training, basketball training, because West Michigan is like a fo- is football country. And basketball is not as, you know, high in emphasis. And it was clear to me quickly that these kids, many of these kids don't have skills. They just play basketball. And that was how basics was born you know, in skill development, conditioning, and then mental strength. And the mental strength is, is really accelerated. So that's how it all started. That's uh, interesting how it, you shifted from the club industry to helping kids develop their skills. Initially, it was, like I said, the mother of invention. I just had to try to make an extra buck. Yeah. And then it turned, it became quickly clear to me that not only don't these kids know how to play, and there's not that many trainers in this vein, but then I realized I could begin to teach these kids off the court skills too, like paying attention and making eye contact and showing up on time and supporting one another and things that we take for granted, right? Absolutely. Uh, our generation, well, I'm older than you, but you know, the older generation in terms of basic people skills, personal skills, you know, school first, you know, things of that nature. And the parents love that. And it grew. You know, I went full time in 06. So for a few years, it was part time. I'm scrambling about working odd jobs. And then uh, I, I went full time in 2006, and it's been 17 years now. That's, that's awesome. And back to your point yeah. about teaching kids almost life skills. It just seems with our electronic society today, they, they miss out on a lot of things. So it's definitely a good thing to instill those. Well, it is. It is. Absolutely. I'm thankful for the opportunity. What sports do you work with now at, at Basics? What, what do you cover? Well, the actual Basics is almost 100% basketball. For about eight or nine years, we did volleyball basics, and I had a terrific trainer. who She went out on her own. I've done soccer basics and lacrosse basics. The model applies to all sports, of course. No travel. That's, that's, a, that's a staple. I don't believe in I mean, traveling is the way things are these days. Uh, parents and players think they need to travel to compete. And it's actually the, the last thing 95% of these kids need to do. They need to stay local, work on their skills and their conditioning and their mental toughness, and then see what happens when the school year rolls around. So we don't travel, uh, and we emphasize skill development over outcomes. So we don't really care about the games and the leagues and the tournaments. We, we care about can the player reach his or her potential. And we measure a lot of these skills, Rob. We, we actually apply a number to a skill, whether it's a crossover dribble or a, a miking drill or a speed and quickness drill. We actually put numbers to them, and the kids understand where that spectrum of skill is. So that's kind of a tactile way, right? We actually measure it. I think that's good. I know Brevin was, I think, excited the other day when he came home from the tryout and he I think he said he got the most on the mic and drill so he was kind of pumped about that (laughs) absolutely now the challenge now is to take those skills and apply them in the game and we've had that conversation yeah let's rewind a little bit talk about where you grew up and what school system you went through as a kid okay I'm one of 10 children I'm the ninth of 10 children and this is part of the mental strength training, too. My father was the team dentist for the New York Giants for 22 years. So I grew up in Connecticut. His practice was in New York. And he, the Mara family, Wellington Mara, they still own the Giants. John Mara is the son. So it was sort of an informal thing back in the 60s and 70s. And one day he just came home and said, hey, I'm working with the Giants on <laughs> dentistry. So we... We uh, went to all the games. It was really cool. They played at Yankee Stadium at the time. The Meadowlands was being built. But I was around. I was able to, as a young kid, to see this level of uh, engagement and effort and concentration at this really the highest level. So nine brothers and sisters uh, grew up in Connecticut, right outside the city, in the Catholic school system in the area. Went to a Jesuit prep school, a boy, all boys prep school known as Fairfield Prep. It was an all-state high school 
basketball player there. Played golf as well, not as well. It was just sort of an afterthought. Had a wonderful childhood. My parents were really, really cool people. There's a video dedicated to them and a memorial fund in their memory. We, we help kids in need. If a kid can't afford to pay, they don't have to pay. And we use the fund to help these, these you know, disadvantaged kids come to basics. That's really cool. Do you remember when you got started in basketball? Yeah, I have four older brothers and significantly older. There were three daughters in the way in the in between there. So my I have a brother who's six years older, a brother who's seven years older, and a brother who's nine years older. So I grew up in the backyard there, just playing basketball in the backyard with my older brothers, getting my butt kicked. <laughs> And that's how kids really move forward. If you have a good player, and we're supporters of this, we call it playing up. So we are very much encourage younger players, if they have some skill, to play up. Because I saw what these older brothers did for me. And by the time I started playing with kids my own age, it was easy. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Do you remember, You, I think you had said school kind of got you started a little bit in golf. Was that what I heard from the last talk? Well, I, I grew up caddying. So I caddied at a local club there in Connecticut. Every Monday, the club was closed and the caddies were permitted to play. It still exists that way. So I would head over there on Monday and play 36 holes and my buddies would come and there was no uh, tournaments, so to speak. We just played amongst ourselves and I gradually became a better player. There's a there was a player I grew up with. His name was Dick Sidoroff, and Sidoroff was a member of this club. Sidoroff won the British Amateur twice. He was low amateur in the Masters once. He, he won the Met, which is a big tournament in the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area, seven times. Just the most elegant player, and I just fell in love watching this guy play, the way he could you know, control the flight of the ball, and it's a majestic game. So I fell in love with it, and I still I still play. I've won the Muskegon Amateur four times. In Muskegon County, I've won the Muskegon County four times. I still play. Nice. Thinking back to when you were a kid, and it could be golf or basketball, what was the best investment that either a parent, a friend, a family member, or you made in yourself that was most helpful along the way that got you to you know the level that you made it to? Wow, that's such a great question. And my answer is really going to be difficult for people to understand uh, in this day and age. The, the greatest thing my parents ever did for me was they allowed me to have the game myself. There was no orchestration. There was no choreography, right? We just were permitted to go and play. And if we were good at what we did, we would continue to do it, right? We would try to get better and find better players and go to a park that might have better players or, you know, have teammates from school and we'd get together and play uh, three on three, but there was no pressure. There was never, and there were no uh, emphasis on outcomes. It's the yeah. single biggest reason why kids this day don't play well in basketball. There's way too much emphasis on the games and the leagues and the tournaments and the outcomes and the points and the rebounds. All they need is skill, condition, and mental strength. That's, that's all these parents should be emphasizing is their skill, their condition, and then how they think. And then when the, when the school season rolls around in October or November, they're ready. But that's not the way it is. And there's, I could talk all day about why it is that way, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you know why it's that way. It's, it's uh, the, the almighty dollar. There's a lot of money to be made out there, so. Yeah, for sure. So did anyone influence you to get into either sport? Did you ever look up to anyone, have a hero or an idol? Dick Sitteroff. And then, uh, you know, in basketball, Larry Bird was always my was my idol. You know, same size as I am, 6'9", not very fast, couldn't jump. He just had incredible skills and was really tough mentally, right? Nobody could intimidate him, so... Bird was a idol. And then in golf, when I went to play, it was Nick Faldo. So I always tried to copy Faldo. Faldo was a big guy, almost 6'5", 
very meticulous with his preparation and his swing, so I tried to copy Faldo. Nice. Do you remember your first ever basketball game? And if you do, can you take us through that experience? <laughs> I just wrote a, a post on this. I don't really remember my first basketball game. I do remember my parents never coming. And oh. when I say that to people, they go, oh, I'm so sorry, Jim. <laughs> it's the opposite, right? The fact that my parents, because I had nine siblings, so they were super busy, right? The fact that they weren't there was a, a, an advantage, right? The game was mine, right? It was my outcomes, right? The first time my dad saw me play, I was second team all state. I was, I was 17 years old the first time my father saw me play an organized game. And that's difficult for parents to understand. Don't you think? Isn't it hard to explain that it's better for the parent not to be there sometimes? And I, I, I argue not all the time. It'd be nice to have them come once in a while, and they did eventually when they had time. But in the interim, I fell in love with the game. I fell in love with uh, basketball and with golf because the outcomes were mine, good and bad, right? And yeah. That, that's, that's the genesis of the mental strength, right, ha having to deal with the bad as well as the good. It's interesting that you say that because I I think that my son does better when I'm not around. I think I bring about this certain pressure that, I don't know, I just feel like whenever I'm with him, he gets, or I'm around, he gets frustrated. Whenever I pick him up after I haven't been there, he talks about how good things went. <laughs> it's a fine line for these parents to understand. Many, many parents I've spoken to over the years who come to me, what can I do to help him? What can I do to help her? And often it's like, okay, don't hang around. Go do some shopping. Let let us, the staff, deal with this kid's development. Because the kids are always looking into the stands or to the stage to see what mom and dad are thinking after a play. Yeah. Like, like there's a uh, judgment, right? There should be yep. no judgment. And that's, you know, what we do. I like that. How about switching to your first ever golf kind of tournament? Do you remember that? And can you talk about that? The one that really resonates is when I got to college. And I my intention wasn't to play golf in college. I was a basketball. I'm 6'9", right? It's not like a natural golf size. And when <laughs> I – it really hurts to – quit playing ball. I mean, I basically had to, my grades were bad. The coach, Gary Walters, who I discussed earlier, had left and went to Providence. There was a new coach coming in. You know, my energy level wasn't there. I was worried about flunking out. So I, I quit playing basketball, And then the which is October, November, and then the golf season begins in April. So I'll never forget trying out, just walking on. And a lot of these guys were great players. And I remember shooting 75 in the first qualifying round, which ended up being like the second or third low score out of about 15 guys. And I thought, wow, I can't, I'm going to make this team. And I, I, I just, I was so excited about it. So I remember that uh, qualifying round very well. That's crazy just to walk on and to do that. Can't imagine what the other guys yeah. were thinking. I did more traveling with the golf team than I did with basketball. It wasn't even close. We went to San Diego twice. We went to Florida. So the golf was a great experience and a big confidence booster. Like I, Basically, I felt like I could do almost anything if I put my mind to it. Confidence is huge in sports. Yes, it is. Why do you love sports, and what keeps you involved with the youth? Sports is a microcosm of life, right? There's wins, there's losses, there's adversity, there's... There's dealing with people you don't like, there, and there, there, there's camaraderie. There's it's life. Sports is life, in many respects. So what keeps me involved are the children. I absolutely love the children. I think the parents, and and you're a parent of a child who's in basics. Hopefully, you feel the, you know, the energy level in the gym and how we care about these kids and our patience and our commitment to improvement. It's not lip service. We really are trying to help these kids on and off the court. Well, I can see it. And I think that it, it does work. I know Brevin's come a long way from super shy and 
he just has has developed some skills over you know with your guys' help so I definitely see it and with all the coaches that you have on staff well I appreciate that he's a fine young man and uh, we have work to do but he's improving back to basketball again what do you feel is the best physical exercise for kids to do to improve their basketball game it could be a drill something without the ball with the ball what do you think Revan's heard this from me a bunch of times there are two primary drills in my mind that if players can sort of master they're going to make most teams one is the crossover dribble so that's changing directions protecting the ball seeing the course right these are that's a key key skill to handle the ball under pressure and change directions and then of course there's the mic and drill right the ability to score near the rim using either hand and in conjunction the proper foot the footwork that's one of the drills that we measure with a number there's also the reverse mic and being able to do the same thing with the players back to the basket it's remarkable how many programs do not do these drills it's absolutely amazing i was watching a uh, a James Harden video the other day, a uh, summer camp workout, and right in the middle of his summer camp workout is the mic and drill. Uh, Durant shows up, Durant's doing the mic and drill. This is done at the highest level. Now, they do it more or less as a warm-up at that level, but with kids, you know, high school and lower, it should be a primary skill development uh, drill. And then, of course, in terms of making teams in basketball, the number one component is their condition. What is their condition? Can they run, 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 and then run some more without becoming fatigued? When tryouts roll around, what is their skill? What is their condition? And then what is their mental strength? How, how do they think? And going back to the, the mic and drill, what's the highest percentage shot you can have in basketball? Probably a layup. And the mic yes. and drill teaches you to do that fast and efficiently. And, you know, when you're timing kids, it gets a little pressure on them. So I think that definitely will develop that skill for that very high percentage shot. <laughs> well, what's fascinating about that drill is it's also the inside pivot. And the inside pivot is used all throughout the game. The inside pivot is used off the dribble when you shoot a jump shot. It's used when you're pivoting after a rebound. So the mic and drill is not just scoring, it's understanding yeah. the use of the inside pivot. And a lot of kids have never even heard this, and that's why we have a pretty high rate of success. We have 145 college players now, 15 Division One, who've come through bases. Yeah, that's nice. Those are some good things. What do you think is the biggest waste of time when people are training for basketball? That one's pretty easy in my mind. It's the travel it's, it's the getting into the car and actually traveling to Fort Wayne or Kalamazoo or Lansing or wherever these poor kids travel to. It was interesting. I had a conversation. I'm beginning to understand it a little bit more. For many of these kids, it's the uh, being with the friends and, and, and developing those relationships. And that's not, that's not something I want to interfere with at all. It's great for these kids to, to develop these relationships. My argument is we're interested in the full development of the player on and off the course. And traveling in a car for multiple hours to me is a waste of time, energy, effort, and money. So I'm really not big on the travel. Yeah. Let's talk now about the mental side of sport. And when did you realize that coaching athletes on their mental strength was very beneficial? When I was playing golf, I played golf from 91 to 96 in Pinehurst. And I, so I started relatively late. I was 30, 31 years of age when I, when I decided to give this a shot. And I, I realized really quickly that I was behind in terms of skill level. I'm playing with guys from North Carolina, Wake Forest, Florida, Georgia. These are great amateur players who are, who are trying to become professional. But I also saw these guys lose their mind on the course a lot. I saw them <laughs> hurt themselves with poor thinking after a bad outcome or a missed putt or a bad break. And I realized if I could just sharpen my skill a bit, uh, nobody was going to be better than me in terms of handling my emotions and channeling 
negative play. And that allowed me to play for almost five years, four of, four of which were as a professional. So I played with Stricker. I played with Azinger. I caddied for Arnie. I was, I was right in the mix. I didn't make it, but it was an inc- <laughs> it was an incredible experience, to say the least, to be in that level of of competition. So, what made you decide that mental strength was so beneficial? You know, if and I'm sure this applies to cycling and to every other sport. It's assumed that the athlete who is trying to reach a certain level, like the highest level they want to reach. It's assumed that athlete has skill and condition, that they're working on their skills and they're working on their condition. That's an assumption. And if that assumption is true, what is the separation point between athletes then? It's how they think. So players who have skill and condition and then they think correctly have a huge advantage over the other athletes. I have this argument where if there's two teams of, or players of comparable or equal skill, the mentally tougher athlete or team will win almost every single time because they're yeah. able to handle the bad breaks. They're able to handle the, the poor outcomes, the bad calls by the officials. They're, they're able to do that in a more efficient manner. Yeah. You can see it on the court too, for sure. Oh, yeah. Why don't you talk about the process of how you go about the mental strength aspect of things with your athletes? I've developed an assessment. It's really interesting, and I, it's taken me a couple of years, but it's, 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 I've done almost 400 of these. The assessment measures the player's confidence, his or her ability to handle failure and mistakes, and then critically, their attitude and commitment to the effort. So there's three components, right? Confidence, handling failure, attitude and commitment. So when I see these results, not a test now, there's no scores or comparative numbers. It's just a snapshot of how that player is thinking at that moment. When I see these results, we then meet for an hour. I'm doing this with programs now. We have a couple of football programs that are doing it, volleyball, soccer, mostly basketball, but a bunch of baseball players, softball players. Then we teach them these four tools. There are four primary tools to mental strength. And these tools are universal. We bring in anecdotes from Steph Curry and Babe Ruth and Djokovic and Serena Williams and Wayne Gretzky and Tiger Woods. All these great athletes from different sports will apply these tools. The tools are routines, visualization, breathe to relax, and then how to clear your head to compete. And we teach these players how to apply these tools. I'm thinking about that right now, and I wish we would have had something like that when I was in high school, because I think I could have benefited from that. I had a really, really hard time clearing the head before competition. So clearing the head is the ultimate. Uh, That's the final tool and the hardest to employ. I mean, how do you play with nothing in your head? So right. the answer to that, the answer to that is, if, if if the player has skill and condition, we've talked about that already. It's funny, Rob. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get parents who want to, who want to sign their kids up for mental strength training, and the kid doesn't have skill and condition. I mean, it it, it doesn't make any sense, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna be mentally you're not gonna mentally tough your way to a win or 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 good play without skill and condition. So right. That's why we highly encourage skill and condition are required. It's assumed. Listen, this training does not exist at the high school level or or younger. It just doesn't exist, and it's completely embraced at the professional level, and it's it's becoming much more common at the collegiate level. Yeah. So if there was one thing, maybe the most common thing, that athletes could take away from you regarding mental strength, what would you tell them or what could they work on? There's a couple that come to mind. One is, well, I'll just give you the principle. The principle is if you have skill and condition and then don't care too much about the outcome, you are the most dangerous athlete on the field or course or in the pool or on the track. 
So if you have skill and condition and then don't care that much about what happens, you're very dangerous. So that's mm. difficult for people to guess. What do you mean don't care? Of course I care. It's a principle to not care that much because if you care too much about the outcome, take a wild guess what's about to happen. <laughs> right? If yeah. You, if you care too much about what's happening, the chances that a negative outcome is about to occur is really high. Now, we're yeah. not saying to the athlete, don't care about anything, don't care. Of course they care. It's a principle of mental strength. It's a, it's a, it's almost like a trick. And like here's a great example. I mean, Curry, a couple of years ago in the finals, in the first half of a game, they're playing Cleveland. They're in Cleveland. They got LeBron and Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love. He's two for 12 in the first half, and he's two for 11 in the second half. Absolutely terrible. He's four for 23 with two minutes to go. In the final two minutes, he makes two shots out of three, and they win the game, and they win that series. So afterwards, they were interviewing him, and they said, how did you how did you do that? It's the worst shooting performance we've ever seen. <laughs> and then at the most critical time, you make two out of three. And his answer was, I don't care about the misses. That's the height of competitiveness, Rob. Yeah. He obviously has he obviously had skill and condition, right? And then yeah. he didn't really he didn't really care too much about the failure. So that's a microcosm. The other thing that comes to mind in terms of your question, especially with young athletes, is they care too much about what other people think. Yeah. One of the statements on the uh on the assessment is I care too much about what other people think. And the answer is sometimes, often, or never. So I have to, they, they, they write sometimes, often, or never. And the vast majority of kids worry about other people, whether they're friends or parents or coaches. And when you start worrying about what other people think, I mean, take a wild guess, does that help your performance or hurt your performance, right? Everybody yeah. knows it, it hurts your performance. So that now we go to the tools, right? We go to the visualization tool, which is seeing things in advance clearly and concisely and with frequency. So if they see in advance, okay, the, their buddies in the stands and, and they, they're worried about what their buddies think or their girlfriend or whomever, they can visualize this happening and then know what to do before it occurs. So visualization occurs before the competition. And it's the best players in the world visualize all the time. Yeah, that's great, actually. When I think back, or even when I play in today's, when I play basketball in, in today, you know, like current time and not just in the past, my biggest worry is when I miss a shot, what my teammates think, right? I don't care what anyone else thinks, but I always worry that what do the teammates think? Because I'm usually a pretty good shooter, but if I start to miss a few, then I start to think, ooh, are they going to get mad if I keep shooting it? You know, it's, fast. It's, it's very common what you just described. When you watch the better teams, I love watching Golden State just because they pass the ball so well. When a guy takes a shot that looks like it's ill-advised or it's, it's too early in the shot clock or it looks like he's just jacking it up and, they, and he misses and they run down the court, you can just sense in their body language that they the whole team is unified and they don't – they're not – thinking about that missed shot, even if it was ill-advised, they're not thinking about it for a split second. They're right back into the play at hand. That takes mental toughness and great coaching. Yeah. No judgment, right? One possession at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. These are all good points. If you were to give general advice to younger athletes that look up to you, what would it be? School first. Emphasize school first all the time. It's a known fact that the, the best athletes in the world are like the smartest guys. LeBron's like a genius. He's really, really smart. And people talk about him as just this physical phenom, and he is. He's also really smart. Curry's really smart. Djokovic, really smart. So school first. Emphasize your books. Things have a tendency to fall in place when the grades fall in place. And then secondly, yep. conditioning. you got to work on your condition. It doesn't matter what the sport is. If it's chess, <laughs> you, yeah. you still have to be in condition 
right? Mentally and physically, it doesn't matter what the sport is. So books in school, condition, always work on your condition. And of course, skills, skills include mental strength. I think with conditioning, I like to tell the kids, if you out condition everybody else, you're going to have a huge benefit. So if that person's doing, let's say three days a week, at like a middle school level of work on their game. If you put in four days, you're going to out condition them. If you're, if you're doing the right things. Correct. And that's, we call that intrinsic motivation. And this is so important for the parents to hear this. I saw a great line. Who was it? It was, I forget who the player was. The motivation comes from within the player. If the parent is like driving the participation, and the, and the player is waiting for the parent to drive the participation. That ain't going to fly for very long. So Correct. the player has to drive it. And this is a telltale story for the parents. If that kid in basketball, for example, if that kid isn't out on the hoop, most of these kids have hoops at their house. If that kid isn't out doing work and playing on that hoop on his or her own, a, a significant period, piece of time, he's not motivated. They're not, they're, not, they're not willing to do the work. So just look to see if the kid is working on his own. I've noticed Brevin, he likes to go to the gym and do the basketball on his own. So we, we do that. And he's motivated to do that by himself. I don't have to tell him, hey, you need to go to the gym. He does that now on his own, which is kind of cool to see. Fantastic. That's fantastic. And, you know, he's also now developing a routine. So the routine is the first part of the mental strength training, rock solid routines. And a critical ingredient to routines, Rob, is to be able to change the routine when it becomes stale or stagnant. This happens all the time. Players will have routines that are working and then all of a sudden they go into a funk and they're not playing well. Well, change the routine. So that, that of course, is done in practice. You never change routines in competition. But they learn that as well with the mental strength. Is there a book or a video or an athlete or even maybe a coach to follow that you would recommend for young athletes to look up to and get a lot of information out of? I had the great fortune of working with a guy named Bob Rotella. Do you know that name, Rotella? I don't think so. So Bob Rotella is regarded in, in many circles as the world's leading sports psychologist. He, back in the 80s and then into the 90s, he started to get a following primarily on the tour, right? Davis Love, Corey Pavin, Freddie Couples, Dennis Watson started to follow him a little bit with regard to mental strength. And then he just took off when these guys started to win. Now everybody wants to work with Rotella. So Rotella was in Pinehurst. He wrote a book called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. That's highly recommended because it applies to all sports. Golf is not a game of perfect. Many players think they have to be perfect. One of the questions on, or statements on the assessment is, I do not need to play perfectly. And <laughs> you cannot believe how many kids feel they need to play perfectly. And if they don't do something exactly right, like they're crestfallen and, they, and now they feel terrible. I would follow Rotella as best you can. He's, he's in his 80s now. He's more towards retirement. But he's got multiple books and multiple videos. Do anything with Rotella and you'll get better. All right. I like that recommendation. You said that was Bob Rotella. Yeah, R-O-T-E-L-L-A, Bob Rotella. And a lot of the mental strength that I do is based on Rotella. Yep. Check him out, buy some of his books, find him in his videos, and you'll definitely get a benefit from that. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before we sign off? You know, I feel like I'm talking to parents most of the time. The kids... I love the kids and the kids are engaged and they're on the course and they're doing their best. It's the parents I really would like to talk to. Show, be as patient as you can be. Eliminate judgment, right? If you've done the best you can, you've succeeded regardless of the outcome. That's the top block of Wooden's pyramid of success, John Wooden. So that's a paraphrase. If you've done the best you can, you've succeeded regardless of the outcome. So even if the kid gets cut or the kid is not playing much at all, if he's doing the best he or she can do, they've succeeded to the best of their ability. So be patient with these kids. The line that I love to use 
the best thing that you can tell your kid, the best thing that you can say to your child is I love to watch you play. And, and that's it. No judgment on what he did in the third quarter. No judgment on how he missed that backhand volley. No judgment on how he fumbled the ball with nobody around him. Right? I just love to watch you play. And that's exactly what they need to hear. And if they have intrinsic motivation, if they're gonna, if they want to do the work on their own, they'll do it. And if they don't, well, enjoy the ride, but don't expect like playing pro ball or college ball. Yeah, that's great advice, especially for the parents. I like that phrase. I love to watch you play. Yep, you can't go wrong. It's interesting. Kids enjoy their grandparents watching them more than their parents. This is a known fact. (laughs) Kids love to have their grandparents watch because the grandparents literally love to watch the kid play, right? They don't really care too much about the outcome. They just love to watch the kid run around. And, you know, that's why kids love to watch to have their grandparents watch them play. Makes sense when you say this stuff. Yeah. 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 Where can people find you on the web if they want to connect with you? Can you give uh, maybe your website and maybe some social media tags? The website is basics, which has an S on the end of it, sports. So there's two S's in the middle, basicsports.com. The cell phone is a great way to reach me with regard to texting or calling, 616-402-1600. And then on Facebook, it's Basics Sports. So, again, two S's in the middle. And uh, you'll see the feed. We have a very active Facebook presence. Well, Jim, I've enjoyed digging in and learning more about you. Keep improving the young kids in the coming years, including my son. (laughs) I, I wish you the best for you and the Basics program. And I appreciate you taking the time today to have this great discussion. Well, I love Brevin. Make sure he knows that, and we'll do our best to help him improve. And thank you for the opportunity to be my first podcast. So thank you, Rob. You're welcome. This was a lot of fun. And to all the listeners, gratitude. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.